The Datavana podcast, hosted by Lon Wax, features visionaries, leaders, and really smart people who join our hosts to converse about marketing, sales, operations, and everything that data ties together. We focus on practical examples, stories, and horror stories centering around what Data Nirvana looks like and what the path is to achieve it. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Data Vana podcast. Today, is a super exciting and interesting day. I think it's the first Datavana podcast that will really be more like a panel today. Your host, Jamie Muirhead, SVP Sales at Ringlead. We're going to be talking about customer data platforms, a new book written by Chris O'Hara and Martin Kine. We also have the chairman of Ringlead and the co-founder of CA Technologies on the phone today, Russ Arts. Welcome, everyone. Thank you. Nice to be here. So why don't we start today with just a, a brief background on, on you guys. Uh, Chris, why don't you start? Yeah, sure. Well, hey, Jamie, thanks for having uh, me. Big, big fan of Ringlead. And I guess um, I came to do this, uh, you know, sort of through a chance meeting with Russ, who's a fellow Long Islander and also um, <laughs> very into the data space, uh, as we all know. I'm also a big reader of his Arts on Datacom uh, on LinkedIn. So we started chatting and, um, you know, Russ came to find out I was at Salesforce, which, um, of course, is a, a big focus of you guys at Ringlead, and also that I was writing a book with my friend Marty on customer data platforms, sort of a new, um, not really new, but interesting software category, very adjacent to um what you guys are doing at Ringlead. So I've uh, been at Salesforce for about four years, came in through the acquisition of a data management platform called Crux, uh, which we acquired. And, and now I re- run uh, global product marketing for sort of the data and identity products inside of Salesforce. Um, so that's kind of a little bit about me. And I'm Marty Kine, I'm Chris's co-author. Uh, as he mentioned, and I uh, used to be a Gartner analyst. I covered the marketing clouds, and Salesforce was a customer of mine. And then I saw their dot going up and to the right, and so I just hopped on the dot before it actually left the magic quadrant altogether and went into a stratosphere. Uh, but all kidding aside, about two and a half years ago, I was hired to look at this category of customer data platforms. There had been some surveys done about CDPs asking CMOs, chief marketing officers, what was their CDP of choice? And Salesforce actually came in first. And at the time, Salesforce didn't have a product called a CDP. So this was very interesting to management internally. So I was put on this project uh, to figure out what is the category? Are we in it already? Do we need to be in it? That kind of thing. So I've been working on that um, pretty much nonstop for two and a half years. And I'm Russ Arts, as Jamie said, uh, I'm executive chairman at Ringlead. I also run all of the R&D, all the research and development. Um, I was the co-founder at CA, CA Technologies, formerly known as Computer Associates. Left about uh, four or five years ago, and four years ago I joined Ringlead um, to help build this software company. And uh, we've, we've built a very powerful data orchestration platform that we can talk more about during this call. So thank you. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Marty, for for joining us. And I look forward to our conversation. Yeah, thanks, guys. So I think it would be great to just dive in. I, I, I think it's interesting that CDP is still something that's relatively confusing. And we'd love to to hear from you guys, obviously, Writing, you know, written the book on customer data platforms. Just kind of walk us through the history and the evolution. R- really, kind of what were the challenges and in, in what brought on the kind of the need and the rise of, of CDP? I can start. The um, the category actually was invented. There is a birthday. It was 2013. And there's a blog post that was written by a guy named David Robb, who is now the, the founder of um, he was the founder and is now the head of the Customer Data Platform Institute, the CDPI, which is a kind of vendor agnostic organization. Uh, he used to live in Pennsylvania and he moved to Connecticut. He's the guy who named it and he actually did a search and he wanted to make sure there wasn't a, a pre-existing category called Customer Data Platform and believe it or not, there wasn't. 
Nobody talked about it, though, really, from 2013 to 2016 or so. And then at that point, 2016, it really took off. I was at Gartner, and it, uh, it shot up what we call the hype cycle. So it just caught on. It became more than a meme. It became a topic of conversation. And uh, that hype is continuing. You know, it's, it's kind of abounded. Um, it's, it, it's not really a new category. It is an evolution of CRM, as we say in our book, Customer Data Platforms. It is, uh, you know, the same in kind. But the, what, it, what it arose to, to serve, the problem that it arose to solve, is um, disconnected data. So marketers ended up with customer data, prospect data, sitting in 15, 20 different applications and they weren't able to kind of organize and harmonize it and make use of it for things like segmentation or sending audiences off to for advertising or marketing. So it really is a it's a kind of a data organization tool, and that's a real problem. Um, and the various CDPs solve it in various different ways. I'm sure Chris has a better answer. No, I think I think you nailed it, Marty. <laughs> and, uh, you know, um, for me, when uh, you started describing this, the survey results we were seeing from a company called um, Advertiser Perceptions, which asked, I think about two and a half years ago, you know, what CDP do you use? And they surveyed all these uh, VPs of marketing and CMOs and something like 70% said Salesforce. And we said, oh, that's really weird. We didn't, you know, we don't have a CDP yet. We haven't even, you know, started thinking about building one. But what people were essentially doing was using their CRM or maybe it was um, even Service Cloud in Salesforce as their central repository and sort of source of truth for marketing data. And then, you know, through a bunch of pipes and different connections, uh, they were stitching that data together and making it useful. Maybe even using a tool like Ringlead to sort of take the data from the CRM and start orchestrating it into different things for, you know, passing leads on or, or data quality or data enrichment, what have you. So what struck us, uh, at least at Salesforce, is we're either, you know, firmly in this category, but we don't know it yet, or, you know, there is definitely a need for some kind of unique application that would, that would help our customers more easily sort of do the sort of data management things, you know, they need to do um, uh, to be, you know, effective. So, uh, and as, as Marty said, I think we're, uh, maybe Jamie, you said it, very early innings, a lot of confusion about the category, a lot of um, disagreement on what exactly a CDP is. And throughout the course of researching the book, uh, you know, Marty and I talked to a ton of different companies and marketers and, you know, got a lot of different answers. So, uh, you know, we can talk about w what those were. Yeah, in chapter three of the book, you introduce the different types of CDPs. Why, why don't you dive into that and kind of educate the listeners today? Yeah, Marty, you want to take this one? Sure, Chris. Yeah, so we we actually, I took I think we took the right approach. As I said, I had been an analyst before, so we're you know I have an analytical mind. So we at Salesforce were receiving RFPs, requests for proposals for this category, customer data platform, and our thought was. We're not going to tell you, the marketer, what a CDP is and uh, sell it to you. We're going to actually try to find out what you're asking for. So when a marketer went into the market for this for this new product, what what do they think it, it does? So essentially, what what is the market need that we're trying to that we're trying to meet with the CDP? And we went through all these RFPs. We went through hundreds of them. It was a painstaking process. Any of you who have done this can feel our pain and it enumerated all of the requests. And in some cases, it really was a fishing expedition. Marketers didn't know what they were asking for. They asked for everything, and they wanted to see what, what boxes the vendor would check. But in general, we realized that there are two categories of need that were being expressed in the CDP. And it really did fall pretty neatly into two different types. One is what we ended up calling a system of insight. And the best way to describe that is it's a single source of truth for customer data or a unified profile or a 360 degree view or whatever you want to call it. But it's essentially a persistent database that stores information from various different marketing, MarTech systems, or even service systems or what have you. And uh, it, it's available for analytics. It doesn't necessarily have to be real time. Um, it's, it's a persistent data record. And then the other system is what we ended up calling system of, it, of engagement. And the system of engagement is much more real time. It's in the moment. It would be, for instance, if someone arrives on your website, you haven't seen them before, 
they're pseudonymous or anonymous, and they start exhibiting behaviors and you get their consent, you can start personalizing in that session. So it's much more about what's happening in the moment and you know fast decisioning. And so these two components, the system of insight and the system of engagement, we felt were essential for the true enterprise CDP. Most CDPs, uh, as Chris pointed out early on, are one or the other. They, they really don't do both. So we, we kind of took, <laughs> we took the high road, but also the difficult road of trying to build both. I think it's interesting in the market, and I think Russ and I talk about this a lot. We, we see a lot of CDP, you know, so they, they, companies identify themselves as CDPs, but they, they really, you know, they miss that core attribute of being the unified, you know, system of record or the unified master. And it's almost as if, Marty, that, a lot of the you know the the vendors and the companies in the ecosystem today identify themselves as CDPs, but really they've just built a CDP type of architecture to perform the functions, right? In order to perform analytics, you're going to typically need to ingest from a multitude of of different systems, um, and I think that is what really confuses the market is. Are they a CDP or are, do they just have architecture that's pulling you know, multiple data sets into a single database that's then um, you know, prescribing a- analytics or using it for machine learning and artificial intelligence, et cetera? What, so in the book, basically, it seems to me, at least how I perceived it, is the, the, the true CDPs are really, you know, like Salesforce's 360 or lar- large SAP and, and Oracle that are kind of going going down that path, whereas there's you know 120 or so other companies identifying themselves as CDPs, but they they really don't intend to be that unified master. What what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I can give you a few ideas. Um, you know, I think it's really really valuable to be a CDP when you're maybe um, an ad tech startup pivoting away from uh, managing data in a cookie-based world, right? We're seeing a lot of changes today with uh, Safari and and Chrome browser changes and privacy restrictions. And we're kind of moving into a first-party world. Um, And the thing is, you know, over the last 10, 15 years, there's been tons of really good innovation in, in ad tech. You know, in the world I came from, Crux, you had a lot of tag management companies trying to, you know, put their code up on websites and, and within apps and try to manage personalization and ad delivery. You had really good bespoke sort of loyalty management tools, which, you know, a big retailer might use to manage their whole loyalty program. You had, um, you know, mobile tag management companies like MParticle who are really good at doing server side SDK management. And then, of course, you had tons of uh, personalization platforms. So uh, any of the above does sort of the the rudimentary data management and storage of a profile and and activates that data um, and can be, you know, sort of fit into the category of CDP. And I think over the last especially uh, five years, being in that very hot CDP category has attracted a lot of uh, venture money and a lot of investment. And it's certainly provided sort of that exit ramp for a lot of companies who may be on their fourth or fifth round of funding. And some of them will, will actually pivot and become really, really good uh, platforms that can, can proudly call themselves CDPs. But as Marty stated, and I think he's right, you know, they kind of either fit into one or two categories uh, based on their heritage. So the former tag management or DMP or, or loyalty or personalization platform has really architected a system that's great for real-time engagement, event triggers, making decisions. Um, Do they store a profile? Yes. Can they activate data out of the system? Yes. But is it really the tool you're going to go in and say, this is where I'm going to 100% manage all of my first-party data? Probably not, right? So we always felt that um, if someone were to figure out how do you get this this system of insights, core data management, plugged into a system of engagement, which is more real-time personalization, uh, that would really be um, the best of both worlds. And, and we really haven't seen it um, happen yet, but it's, it's really exciting. So I think the CDP uh, 
uh, game, maybe in the bottom of the second inning at most. And I think we're going to see a lot of evolution over the next four to five to really 10 years. And to me, this is the most exciting place to be in marketing because when you really get down at it, data transformation or digital transformation at its core is really all about how you're managing the data. And it's a little boring and, and technical, right? Thinking right. about architectures, but that's really where um, all the effectiveness starts is at the data level. Yeah, exactly. R Russ, what are, what are your thoughts on on the role of of you know customer and contact data and, and how it plays in, into CDP? Obviously, it's not the only data that's being housed in in you know in customer data platforms, but um, you know in in chapter four, Marty and, and Chris really dive into organizing customer data and, and talk about the importance of the actual data data hygiene and data quality. What what are your thoughts on um, and what have you seen as kind of a, a best practice to ensure um, accurate and and um, you know having the right data at the right time? Sure. Well, th thanks, Jamie. So. You know, as you as we mentioned before, so I joined Ringleet four years ago, and one of the reasons I joined is I saw a real problem. You know, when I was at CA, I saw it was a problem. At many other customer sites, I saw customer data and customer data quality was a major problem, and it still is today. So that we've, at Ringleet, we've really dedicated ourselves to build a very strong data orchestration platform to make sure that the data, wherever it might reside, it might sit in a Salesforce CRM, in a marketing automation system, in a CDP, you know, we're dedicated to making sure that the data gets cleaned, get, we get rid of all the poor quality data, we make sure the data is not stale, we enrich it, et cetera. And all, a lot of our customers have come to us talking about using a CDP, or a data warehouse where they will store the data that's coming from, from their CRM like Salesforce and from other systems as well. The data may come, as Chris and Marty were saying, the data may come from an ERP system, it might come from an MDM, it might come from a marketing automation system, and the CDP kind of consolidates it all and creates unique profiles for each of the contacts and, and accounts. And our role there is really to empower the CDP, and in fact, we had an instance where one of our large customers, a Fortune, Fortune 100 company, came to us and we was using our product for, for data quality and data orchestration. We're using our enrichment, they were using our data cleanse and routing. And they came to us and they said, you know, we've consolidated our data into one CDP. Um, and it's a third party CDP, it wasn't Salesforce's, it was, it was somebody else's. And what they did is they said, look, we like the way you clean the data and enrich it and route it, et cetera. We're gonna send the data from the CDP every day. We're gonna send you CSV files, multiple CSV files, and we want you to process it and run it through your orchestration platform, which is exactly what we did. So one use case we found for a CDP was to take data from the CDP, it gets sent into our, what we, in our Amazon cloud, we use something called S3 buckets to store the CSV files, and then we process them. We process the files, we make sure there's no duplicates, we check before they get processed, we enrich the data, we, you know, we route the data to the appropriate account owner, et cetera. So really our role is to position ourselves in between these various systems, whether it's a CDP or a data warehouse, you know, or, or a CRM system, you know, we're kind of positioned in the middle there to help orchestrate the data. Um, so, you know, I, I see CDPs as growing. Uh, it's, it's definitely needed because, you know, everyone wants a single version of the truth. We, we don't pretend to be a CDP, but instead we empower the CDPs with our data orchestration platform. That's so interesting, Russ. And, and I remember writing in the book towards the end, Marty and I wrote, you know, some predictions about the future. Obviously, there's going to be sort of a category shakeout. You can't have 142 CDPs. Right, exactly. But um, what we wrote about is sort of the interesting adjacent opportunity to CDP, whether a company's 
like you said, has their core, like they're storing their first party data in a CDP, it's a CRM, it's a data warehouse, a lake, wherever their sort of source of truth is, to get adjacent to that and, and be able to sort of slot in and do things like data enrichment, data quality, lead routing. Um, that to me is, is interesting because CDP today is primarily concerned with marketing. And there's a big old use case uh, for marketing, building journeys, personalizing ads, email messaging, whatever. And that's exciting, but I think that's really the tip of the spear. If you think about the very many ways data needs to be portable and, and ported to different applications, business applications, enterprise applications, sales applications, that to me is where the big gap in the market is. And, and I don't think we'll see that really coalesce um, around a leader because it's it's just so nascent. But people who understand that opportunity, I think are gonna be very successful. Right, no, I, I agree, Chris. And, and, and as you know, you know, you, the systems, the CDP or data warehouse, you know, it's only as good as the quality of the data, you know, and if the quality isn't there, you're going to run into the same problems you run into when you're using your, your CRM, you know, so we, we think of ourselves as, as a way of empowering, you know, the CDPs to ensure that they have the highest quality data. Right. And I'll just add one thing. I'm sure Marty would want to jump in, but we, the interesting world we live in today as far as data quality um, is we're living in a world where a lot of publicly available third-party data uh, really comes from cookies and, and data that was collected before uh, GDPR and, and CCPA really kicked in. So that's kind of going away at scale in the next 18 months. So what replaces it? You know, How can you be sure that the data you're collecting on your customers um, is relevant, is the latest, is of a certain quality, and then how do you enrich it with other data attributes to know whether someone is you know, in market for your product or has a good credit score, and, and that whole world has to be kind of reconstructed in this new privacy uh, first environment, which is, is great to me. It's just a, a big opportunity, and, and we're just at the beginning of it. The, I mentioned earlier the hype cycle at Gartner and how the CDP went up the hype cycle. I think for a time there was a perception that the CDP was a kind of a silver bullet. Um, it was it was a naive perception on the part of marketers that it was sort of the system to rule all systems and maybe you get a CDP you didn't need anything else. And that I mean that's no longer the case. I don't think anyone really believes that. But. Um, we became, Chris and I became friends with David Robb, you know, the inventor and CDP Institute founder, over the course of writing the book. And he said, you know, his legacy would be that you know, in the future, every MarTech diagram will have a box in it that says CDP. And I think that's true. There will be a box for CDP, but it's surrounded by the rest of MarTech. It's just a component. I mean, it's a very useful component, uh, and it'll help you to future proof your MarTech stack. But there's still a data pipeline. There's still, you know, data. The, you need to source your data. You need to be able to do data hygiene and all the stuff that Ringlead does. And you also need to be able to do a lot of other things for marketing and service and what have you. So it's a component of the MarTech stack. Unfortunately, it's not kind of the final solution. So. Yeah, that that that's definitely interesting. I, I agree. I think you know people are always looking for that silver bullet, and um, you know always looking for you know from a consolidation perspective. So in, in chapter four, with you know in terms of organizing customer data, you guys give a, a really good example of of Lando you know Lando Lakes, and that really resonated um, with me. Just I think for the for the audience today, you guys could just kind of walk walk through that example. Um, and tie it together again from an education perspective, um, and we can tie it back with with Russ. But there's really kind of five five components in that: data ingestion, data harmonization, identity management, segmentation, and, and activation. Um, at a high level, can you just can you walk the listeners through through that today? Uh, I'm happy to do that. The Lando Lakes is a um it's a Midwestern company. It's very well known in Minnesota, where I used to live, based in Minnesota. It's uh, kind of a farmer cooperative, but essentially they sell da dairy products. They have two businesses. They sell dairy products on the one hand, so butter and stuff like that, which you well know if you live in Michigan or Minnesota or Iowa. 
And they also sell um, farm products, so kind of B2, they have a B2B business where they sell like feed for animals and so on. And they, uh, they're a large and sophisticated operation. They have a, um, a, a big IT bench, and they actually like to do a lot of building themselves. So they tended to be, believe it or not, ahead of the curve on the tech side. And they had an issue early on where they wanted to improve their, their marketing measurement. So essentially, they wanted to create a command center where all of the paid, earned, and owned campaigns they were running would somehow be displayed on a dashboard. They'd be organized somehow, and they'd be able to make better decisions on how to spend their, their budget and how to kind of organize their, their um, marketing efforts. And in order to do that, this was five, six, seven years ago, before there were any, anyone was really talking about CDP, they built something that looked a lot like CDP. And we were impressed. With, I remember I was a Gartner. I visited them, and I was impressed with it. They used one of the companies that we actually ended up acquiring, Datarama, to do a lot of this. But they, uh, they built a pipeline where they were able to ingest data from all those systems I mentioned. So, you know, Facebook ads, they ran Google ads, they had search ads, they also had email campaigns. They had um, campaigns that were running on their sites and in their apps. They were able to pull all that data in. They used Datarama to do harmonization and, and integration. So basically, at the campaign level, not at the user level, but at the campaign level, they organized it. And then harmonization simply means um, or lining up the attributes. So this is the plumbing aspect. If you know one column in one database says F name, and then in the other column in another database says first name, it was able to kind of automatically figure out or manually figure out that that's actually referring to the same piece of data, the first name. So doing that kind of thing behind the scenes is important and uh, critical and not very sexy. But anyway, they did that. They put it on, they dumped it all into a data uh, mart, so kind of a, a, a data store in the cloud. And then they were able to do, they pointed um, segmentation tools at it. So they were doing a lot of coding themselves, but they did, they built a drag and drop interface on top of it so they could do segmentation. And then they built a way to export those audiences out to, you know, other systems. So they kind of put together piece by piece, they built their command center, so they had visualization, but they put together a pipeline that did, you know, those five things that you mentioned, uh, Jamie. So data ingestion, data organization, harmonization, they did identity management, they were able to do segmentation on top of it, and then they could do activation. So that's basically putting together a list or an audience or a segment and sending it out, sending it out on an e you know, any for an email campaign, sending it out to Facebook to do some Facebook advertising. And so that, you know, that end-to-end -end process impressed us, as I said, but in a way, a lot of that has been automated through the, you know, the development of this category of customer data platform. Not all of it, but a lot of it. And so that really, um, the plumbing, the behind-the-scenes work, you know, the unglamorous work of marketing is what the CDP is designed to take care of. And I think they were a great kind of case study. Yeah, that that is a great case study, Russ. Uh, I'd love to get your your feedback sure. on the parallels between you know the, the, those five components and and what you've built at at Ringley because I think I think there's a lot of a lot of similarity. I'd, I'd love to to get your feedback. Sure, on that. sure. I think it it, it complements you know what we're doing at Ringley. You know, <clears throat> there's a there's a flow of data that's going to happen, you know. The data is not going to only sit in a CDP. It's not going to only sit and reside, you know, in a CRM or a marketing automation system. There's a need for interaction, you know. So our role, we see our role at Ringlead is to work with all of these systems real time or batch, you know, so that when, you know, Marty talks about the CDP and, you know, segments get activated, that's when we would get control. You know, you activate a segment, you know, or multiple segments based upon certain conditions, you know, we would get control of that data, and then we can orchestrate the data to flow to a CRM, to flow into our system where we'll make sure that there are no duplicates, we'll make sure the data doesn't get stale, so we'll enrich, we'll standardize the data or normalize it, you know, we'll route it to the right account owner, and then, you know, based upon the flow of control that the customer wants, the customer will be able to control where they want the data to go next. After right. we go through our orchestration, they might have certain conditions set where, 
you know, if the value of a particular field, for example, is, is of a certain maybe geolocation, you know, we want to normalize the data and enrich it. But if it fits a different value, maybe we just want to go through the dedo process, you know. So we're the orchestrator of the data, and based on the, the data that we see, we're able to process it and really control the flow. You know, we might be integrating back into a CRM like Salesforce. We might be integrating in directly into a marketing automation system like Marketing Cloud or, or Marketo or HubSpot, you know, or even into an ERP or a CDP system. So we see ourselves as the orchestrator of the data, working very closely and what I call empowering the various CDPs. But we would generally get control when when the segment gets activated, or you know, we'll also get control when we're sending data back to the CDP in the form that they request. So I, I think there's a good fit. There's a lot of synergy there. That makes perfect sense, Chris. You you, you mentioned CDP. You know, I, I think kind of categorically, as we're in the early innings. You know, we're we're in the second inning. Where where, where do you see? You know, the third, fourth, fifth innings. Um, what, do, what do you see as the big kind of shifts in in the landscape? Yeah, sure. That's it's a pretty great question, and it's obviously pretty hard to answer because we're sort of predicting the future. But so today, if CDP is is kind of about um, a single source of truth, I think people have to get their first party data management. Houses in order, um, as Marty described early on, you know, the fundamental problem the CDP is really trying to solve is you have all these gigantic monolithic vertically integrated silos of data that over time companies have acquired MarTech and AdTech and they've stitched them together through pipes. So just kind of getting that data in one place and making it accessible to other systems and having a single source of truth you know, could occupy the next two to three years for, for most businesses because it's such a thorny, you know, uh, knot to kind of untangle. So after you kind of do that, I think phase two is can you kind of attach that system of insight to all the various systems of engagement right. you might have in your company, whether it's lead routing or activating programmatic advertising or activating email and journeys, right? So that's more marketing focused. Where phase three is, and I think it gets the most interesting, and I, and I really believe that marketing perhaps is the, the least interesting application for a CDP, is activation beyond marketing. You know, can you personalize a real life experience in a store by sending instructions to a point of sale system so the salesperson yeah. can personalize your experience or to a car dealership salesperson or to a call center, something that's that's happening today, but it's it's fairly small in terms of who, who's doing that sort of thing. So activation and sales, service, commerce, um, all as important or maybe more important than the kinds of personalization and activation uh, happening in marketing. So that's really phase three and phase four is how much can AI empower I was just gonna say us to do that, right? Yeah. So instead of I'm a marketer, I'm thinking about this campaign, people who want to buy a red sports car, instead of me sort of navel gazing and figuring out the five different data attributes that make you know that person a good sports car buyer, what if AI can just look at thousands of campaigns I've already run at the people level and not only suggest how to build my segmentation, but where I might find the most effective reach across many, many different channels, uh, inclusive of marketing, but also maybe inclusive of other experience, digital out of home, in store, whatever it is. So I think that's really the final phase is when AI starts to really empower these systems to uh, do more of the work themselves. I think that's really interesting. And I think <clears throat> one thing that at least for me personally that I find really interesting is when you think through security and compliance, I actually want my information to, to be tracked. I, I want my decisions to be available so I can be better marketed too. It's interesting to me as a consumer of, of products and just being on the internet. Um, I actually enjoy that 
you know, that, that I'm, that my decisions and and my behavior is, is being engaged with and I'm being, uh, you know, there's, there's messaging and marketing put forth, um, that I actually engage with. And I think there's going to be that kind of double-edged sword or, or juxtaposition of, you know, what, what do we want to be known of our behavior and our actions so we can be better, uh, and, and properly advertised to versus that, um, you know, the, the, the concept of, of privacy and, and almost not wanting to, it's like, I don't opt in or opt out of messaging really per se. And I, I think just as a personal, um, you know, experience, I, I actually always say like, I, I, I'm okay with my information being, you know, used to, to properly, um, provide ads that, um, I'd actually like to see. What, what are your thoughts? What are your thoughts on that? Well, I mean, our, our internal research, Jamie, around this, and, and you know, we at Salesforce have been thinking about this a lot, is that people are quite clearly are comfortable with having their, their data uh, captured, collected, and analyzed in the service of personalization or more relevance. But right. you have, to, you have right. to check some boxes first. Number one, they have to know it's being collected, so it has to be out in right. the open. People don't like being talked about behind their backs, it turns out. That's number one. Number two, they need to have a yeah. sense of control. So they have to believe that if they change their mind, they don't like you anymore, they tell you to forget them, that you will do that and that, that they have the right. ability to tell you that. And the third thing is the, is the value exchange. So they have to get a perception of what they're getting is equal to what they're giving. And I think that you know, it's just commonsensically, if I think about um, my experience on Netflix, I like when they recommend movies to me. You know, I don't really care that they've seen what I've watched because the recommendations are pretty right. good. So I'm okay with that. And I right. think most of us kind of feel that way with marketers. Yeah. I'll just add one thing, Jamie, to that. I agree with all that. And I think that most people, they, want, they do want a level of control right. you know, and privacy. And one of the things that I, one of the capabilities that I think is going to emerge from it all is the ability to not just declare certain levels of privacy, but also to have automatic enforcement of your privacy. Uh, And I think, you know, that's the next step. You know, a lot of the the systems out there, they let you declare what level of privacy you want. I don't want to be contacted at this time of day, that kind of thing. But then the actual enforcement is going to be, is going to be really important. And I saw the same thing happening in the security marketplace where, mm-hmm. you know, you, you declare access rights and then you want it enforced at real time at, at, at all times. Yeah, and I think that's that's probably going to be a challenge at, at, at scale uh, across yep. at a number scale. of yep. disparate systems. Yep. And that, that really probably is, I, I agree, Chris, well, that kind of being late, late stage, that's going to be, a, you know, a necessity of, of both CDP as well as artificial intelligence to, to keep track of, uh, of all I, that at scale. Yeah, I was going to go back to my, and it's a terrible example for this year, but it's an airline example. I haven't been on an airline for a year, but right. me neither. <laughs> I, I fly a lot. I used to fly a lot of Delta and it was just fascinating yeah, me to me that um, I book always on the web. I use my computer. And then I'm always, um, you know, screwing around with my reservation on mobile. So, and then I might even call the call center and they may tweak, you know, the reservation I have. And then I go and I I get to the airport, I check in, I go to the club, they know who I am, they check me in. And then even on the plane, I'm kind of greeted. And that experience goes from web to mobile to call center to uh, a real life experience to actually being on the plane. And then, of course, after I get an email, how is your flight and rate it? And I'm like, wow, that's like five or six different systems all operating in near real time to pick up my reservation, understand my travel habits, uh, recommend new things and just keep track of, of my um, my loyalty. And uh, for that very reason, I, I really, you know, I become so loyal to that airline. I really won't yeah. um, fly anything else, even though they're a little bit more expensive for certain routes. And I think that reflects uh, the research that Marty alluded to, where 80% of consumers not only want that, but now they're at the level because, thanks to Netflix and Amazon, they actually expect 
that level of personalization. So if you're not Delta, you know, an airline company who basically has to do that to survive and, and make their system work, and you're just a regular marketer that sells TVs or shoes or cars, that's a big transition to make. So I, th I think the CDP is popping in at the right time because without that fundamental technology, you really can't do that. And um, you know, when it comes to things like data orchestration and quality, you know, you're going to need partners like that to attach to that CDP box to, to do the routing and the quality and orchestration things that can make that experience not only happen, but make it better. So very interesting times we live in. Yes, it is. And, and, and with that, I, I think we are out of time today. So Chris and, and Marty and Russ, thank you so much for joining and um, really insightful conversation. And thanks for everyone listening. Thanks, Jamie. Thanks, Jamie. Thanks, Jamie. Bye.